Okay, everyone, thank you so much for listening to me there while they were sorting out the tech. My name is Yara, I've said this before. It means woodland in Hebrew, I really like that. So, our first speaker, everyone, is Ben Orford this morning. Thank you all very much for coming to listen to Ben. Ben is a top knife maker expert, and guess what he's going to be talking about? <laughs> Knives, that's right. Give a warm welcome, a warm good morning welcome to Ben Orford, everyone. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Wow, that's weird. I hear my own voice. Okay. <laughs> right. Well, I'm glad there's a few people here. I was getting worried. I thought, blimey, they've seen that I'm on stage and they've obviously decided to stay in bed, really. <laughs> So yeah, I was asked uh, very recently, so I haven't got a projector, I haven't got slides, but hopefully my, uh, my, uh, my lovely Herefordian accent will be enough uh, of a, a sort of entertainment for you. But um, yeah, they asked me if I could speak about, well, they asked me if I could speak about anything really. So I decided that I might choose my two sort of favourite subjects really, which one is me and the other is knives. So uh, yeah, you're going to get a bit of both of them really. but. I know that a lot of you have probably heard little snippets when we do our demos and stuff, obviously a little bit of my background and my history come into the sort of some of the discussions and stuff, but I don't know whether anybody's really sort of gathers how my sort of path into bushcraft actually started really, and it was kind of a an indirect route to where I am now really, but probably a lot of you in the audience almost all started with the same sort of, sort of stimulants that I probably had when I was a kid, so for me... I grew up on a farm, so basically from sort of the age of probably, I hate to think, probably three or four, I was wandering around our sort of nine acres on the farm with a pen knife in my pocket, a box of matches, a small little hatchet, and I'd just go off for the day and make camps and chop trees down and carry my sort of uh, copy of Lofty Wiseman's survival handbook and try and make little traps and try and make little shelters and fires and stuff like that. It wasn't really known as bushcraft to me at that stage. It was purely just the love of the outdoors and just being outside and camping and obviously going into the scout group and sort of going camping and going on the rivers and stuff like that. So it was only later on, probably when I was probably about 13 and 14, that the fantastic TV series, and I don't know whether you guys saw it, was Tracks. And it was like, suddenly there was something on the TV that actually spoke to me. It actually had some kind of content that, that actually made sense to what I wanted to be doing. And there was those 10 minute slots with Ray Mears, which obviously was like probably the best TV in the world and always ended too, too quickly and always left you wanting more. Um, but there was also other little 10 minute slots in there. And okay, the Mearsy stuff was brilliant and I'd be going to the ex-army stall and buying my green uh, bivvy bags and my ex-army lightweight strides and things like that and getting out getting out in the woods and making my cooking pots from uh, big catering size cans from the, from the school canteen. Um, but there was also this one fantastic episode and kind of ironically Lois saw the same episode as well and that sort of set us both on our same path and it was this one episode where there was a, a lady, one of the presenters, called Lindsay Cannon, and she went into the woods and she met a guy called Stuart Whitehead, and he was a bodger. And I'd never heard of this terminology of a bodger before. And basically, a bodger was a, a, a traditionally a chap working in the woods with a very old-fashioned pole lathe, so a very a sort of primitive form of wood-turning lathe that used a bent pole as the power source, so no electric literally out in the woods and it was just totally, just totally blew my mind watching this person working on this lathe, making shavings just purely with the power of, of nature really. Now obviously I saw that on the TV and I had no, no sort of idea where you could find out more information about this. This is, this is the time where Google didn't exist and I didn't even know how computers work so there was no, there was no Google or anything like that. So fortunately because I lived in a rural community and we had our three counties show, our agricultural show at the local showground. They actually allowed us to have a day off from school to go. A lot of the, lot of the kids at school had livestock that they were showing and things like that. So I got a day off from school and I went to the three counties showground and I actually saw in the Woodland Craft area one of these pole aids. And of course I identified it straight away because I'd seen it on the TV with Lindsay Cannon and on the track series. So I went over and I probably watched this guy turning wood and making babies rattles and 
wowing the crowd with his woodwork and his talking ability. And this chap was a guy called Mike Abbott. So this is uh, where it all started, really. So this was the pole lathe that I saw at the uh, at Three Counties show, and this was the chap that I met. And I picked up one of his flyers, and I didn't commit there and then because I was a a very poor school child with no pocket money, <laughs> and I couldn't commit to buying a book. Um, so I took a flyer and then basically ordered it via post when I got home. And when I mailed off the cheque and self-addressed envelope, I realised that this chap was only about three or four miles down the road. So being a sort of enthusiastic guy, I sort of uh, said to him, you know, if there's any work you need doing, give us a shout and I'll come and help you out. So I was still at school at that stage. So I was still uh, getting ready for my uh, GCSEs and things like that at that stage. So I went and helped him out a little bit and helped him working in the woods. And he basically said, oh, you can come along. We've got this fantastic uh, handmade hewn uh, crook frame barn that they were putting up in the, in the woods. Come along and, and help us put this barn up. But unfortunately, it fouled just when I was doing my GCSE. So I couldn't take the time off even though I would have liked to. <laughs> I couldn't take the time off at that stage to actually build this barn with him. So he basically said, well, look, get your, get your GCSEs done, and then you can come and help me for probably 12 days after I'd done my exams. And that's what I did, basically. That was my first encounter with woodworking. So I went and helped Mike in his garden. Uh, we built a very crude workshop with uh, tarpaulins and set up some lathes. And in that 12 days, it really whetted my appetite to the world of woodwork. So I was learning how to use hand tools. I'd used hand tools and axes before, but actually learning how to use them properly, safely, efficiently. Learning how to cleave wood. Learning the joy of working with green timber. And that was a real stimulus for me. That, was ex that sort of showed me that finally there was something that really ticked all the boxes of woodwork. I'd done sort of messing around woodworking in my dad's shed, you know, using seasoned bits of timber and making sort of crude swords and things like that. But this finally was the thing that actually showed me that this, this, could, this could be possible. I could actually do some, something, you know. So uh, it, was, it was a real eye-opener for me to actually see that this was available. And obviously I was very lucky, the fact that it was only a few miles down the road, really. Um, so that was my first sort of eye-opener to that. Now, obviously, at, at that stage, I didn't really know that you could earn a living from that kind of uh, that woodwork. Obviously, he was saying that it was sort of hand to mouth, and you have to do shows and make furniture and run courses, and it was kind of daunting that I could actually do that. But I think after I'd got my GCSEs done, I was thinking that a lot of my friends were saying, "Oh, they'll go back and they'll stay on at sixth form and they'll do A levels and they go off to university." And I could feel this this sort of draw of of staying with your friends, just doing what felt comfortable and safe um, and not necessarily doing what you wanted to do but just carrying along with the masses. Um, and it, it sounds kind of cheesy but at that same stage I, uh, I saw uh, Braveheart, the film uh, with Mel Gibson and that had just come out and that was everywhere and it, it for me, I mean, it was a great film, but there was just one moment in that film which sort of gave me the the courage to, to do what I wanted to do. And there was this scene in there where his father had actually uh, passed away and he was having this sort of uh, dream of his dead father talking to him and he said, your heart is free, you've just got to have the courage to follow it. And it, I know it wasn't necessarily aimed at me, but it sort of opened something in my mind and I thought, well, that's, I, I am free. I can pretty much do anything I want to do so long as I've got the sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, bravery to, uh, to go with it. So that's what I did, basically. I sort of uh, decided I wasn't going to go back to school. I wasn't going to carry on with my, uh, my A-levels, even though it was kind of the safe, sort of non-scary option to do. And I managed to persuade Mike, even though he was very reluctant to take on any more apprentices because he'd had apprentices in the past and he said that it almost sort of financially ruined him. Um, he managed to persuade uh, two other uh, craftspeople to sort of share me. So in the end, I ended up with this sort of fantastic hybridised uh, apprenticeship, which basically consisted of working with Mike Abbott, doing uh, the pole lathe turning, chair making, and running courses and there was also another lady who owned 
a share in the same woodland where we were, they were set up to do in all these courses called Clissett Wood. And that was a lady called Gudrun Lights. And then there was another chap who owned a share in the woodland who was a, a, a coppice worker. So he did all the woodland management, hurdle making, charcoal burning, all those kind of traditional woodland crafts. And his name was Steve Betts. So basically I had a, an apprenticeship that they set up called the Philip Clissett Memorial Apprenticeship. And that was based on the Victorian chair maker called Philip Clissett, who was in, local to the area of Bosbury where the wood was. Um, and they set up this sort of apprenticeship purely to sort of it was tailor-made for me, really, so I was incredibly lucky that they they were brave enough to sort of see my enthusiasm at, at sort of 16 and take me on. So I started, well, I couldn't start straight away, so basically I had to wait until I was 17 due to sort of like funding and trying to tie it into a, an academic course, basically. They, they, to get sort of funding to help, to, to help the apprenticeship actually get off the ground and happen, they wouldn't let me just learn skills that didn't have any kind of certification. So basically, it's no good being able to actually create the chair or make the spoon if you didn't have a qualification to say that you'd reached a certain level. So they had to try and tie it into some kind of city and guilds or some kind of training scheme. So it kind of weird, I ended up having to do furniture design and cabinet making, which even though it's working with wood, working with seasoned timber compared to felling a tree and using an axe and a draw knife, it's like it's like the difference between being a bricklayer and, 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 a, and a potter. It's like, it's the same sort of material, but it's such different levels of hardness and technique. It's, it's like poles apart. So it's kind of weird that I ended up having to go one day a week to college sitting in uh, sitting in a room designing sort of very traditional uh, cabinets with dovetails and things like that and the rest of the week I was out in the woods chopping trees down with chainsaws and splitting them up with axes and that was the bit that I really liked to be honest <laughs> so that was my sort of initial start in the the world of, of green wood which obviously now that I'm a tool, sort of more known as a tool maker and a, 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 a knife maker than a, than a woodworker um, you kind of think, well, how are these two things linked? Now, because this was a traditional um, woodworking techniques, a lot of the tools were either unavailable because they literally weren't being made anymore, or they were uh, old tools that were so badly damaged or so neglected over years of sort of being sat in somebody's shed that you needed to spend a hell of a lot of time restoring them. So. Almost straight away, as I was working in the woods and needing draw knives and needing sort of spoon knives and things like that, I started to make my own tools. Um, not necessarily because I chose to at that stage, but just through necessity and also being on a pretty minimum wage. So my apprentice wage was only £10 a day, so I didn't have a lot of spare cash to sort of, uh, sort of buy expensive tools at that stage. And to be quite honest, the few tools that I did save up for and buy, quite often either didn't work, they were blunt, or they just weren't, it was almost like they were designed by somebody that had never actually used them for the intended purpose. So being a woodworker and actually using those tools for that particular task really helped the concept of actually designing that tool to make it work efficiently. So pretty much working in the woods and making tools at the same, same time, side by side, using lots of recycled materials. So I was using lots of old car springs and old files and stuff like that. And like I say, at that stage, Google still wasn't on the scene, so I used to get very excited when a new, a new uh, yellow pages came for so sort of tool suppliers and places where you could get steel heat treated and things like that. So yellow pages was my Google of the day, but I was fortunate that I managed to pick up a copy of um, this book, which was in a, an old. It was a distribution of a company called Attleborough Accessories, um, and they used to sell this copy of this this book. And it was probably the best thing that I ever bought. Now this was step by step knife making by David Boy, and I kind of thought it wouldn't be that applicable because it's got a picture of a chef's knife on the front. And I thought, well, I don't really want to make chef's knives at this point. But the great thing about this book, and I highly recommend any of you that are interested in, in knives or tool making to, to get a copy of this. Still, it's still being published even now is he takes the whole the whole sort of journey of making knives from from literally using recycled uh, steel so he uses uh, a lot of saw blade steel so he will actually cut out a lot of his blades from circular saw blades and recycle those steels but he'll take it through from cutting out the pattern grinding it putting the handle on how to make the handle pins what woods and things to use for the handles um, and, 
and it just really simplified things. And the thing that I liked about it, it was lots of pictures. Now, I can read, I'm not dyslexic, but the, the written word has never been my favorite thing. So pictures, you know, the more pictures, the better. Um, so that a very good pictorial journey on the, the way of actually getting into knife making. So that was my, that was my sort of real step up in the, in, the, in the world of actually getting into the tool making side of things rather than just purely working wood. Um, so in that stage, I was still obviously still working in the woods, still doing lots of teaching, uh, running lots of courses, and lots of people would attend those woodworking courses. And even though they would be told on their kit list to remember to bring a pencil, a tape measure, and a craft knife, um, the amount of people that would turn up with neither of anything. So obviously, I used to make my own knives, and I'd have a few on my belt. And during the course of the week, when even though we were using lathes and things like that for turning the chair legs and using shave horses, a knife is probably the most basic craft tool that you're ever going to encounter, really. It's so fundamental whether you're using it to sharpen your pencil before you're marking out where your joints are going to go, or even just chamfering the ends of your chair rungs to put a nice chamfer on to help them assemble. So basically a knife was prob probably the most basic bit of kit that you could have used on that course. So. Obviously, me being me, I'd got a few knives on my hip. I was not trying to look like sort of Rambo or anything, but knew that they'd be useful in the woods. And you'd lend a few knives out to people for the for the course. And at the end of the course, they'd be like, oh, this is not a bad knife. You know, where, where did you get this from? And then when you told them that you'd made it, their sort of face and their expression and their, their sort of appreciation of that tool suddenly changed. Um, and quite often, they, they would would want to buy that knife and it was kind of perfect marketing really yeah <laughs> if I'd have been in business school they'd have probably said that it was really good but I wasn't that for thinking really so the first few tools and the first few knives that I made I actually sold them directly through um, through those courses um, and that was how I sort of started really that was my sort of very beginning of my tool making green woodworking journey really um, so my apprenticeship ran for three years. It was going to only be two years, but I, I wanted to do an extra year. And that last year, they they did actually send me on a, an evening class doing some blacksmithing and stuff like that. So I got a bit more of a, a sort of background in working in metal as well as working wood. Having said that, the evening classes on blacksmithing were mostly for making fire pokers and hooks and leaves and things like that, which was great. It was fantastic to learn how to actually manipulate metal but of course I went there and I said I want to make an ads and I want to make a draw knife and I want to make all these sharps and really that wasn't what they wanted me to do or that they, they didn't want to teach to do so once they showed me how to do the sort of the basics which everybody else on the evening class was doing I was sort of left to my own devices and just sort of you know, I had to make mistakes and learn on my own really so I've made a few first few sort of draw knives and stuff like that and, and took it from that level really now at the end of my apprenticeship scheme, they knew that I was nuts on bushcraft as well, because I used to always bring in my copy of uh, Ray Mears Survival Handbook into the woods and show people bushcraft. I was trying to sort of draw people into the woods even more, even though they were only there to make chairs. I wanted to show them that there was just an amazing world out there. Um, so they knew that I was dead keen on, on the bushcraft courses as well. Having never been on a bushcraft course, uh, only just doing it from books and just, just, just trial and error. They actually managed to secretly sort of book me a course uh, with Woodlaw. So when I was 20 and I'd finished my three years uh, working in the woods, they actually sent me for a, a nine-day course, a prim tech course with, uh, with Woodlaw. And I had the opportunity to actually go down to, to, to Etchingham and actually do a course with, with Ray himself and there was a chap called Chris Boynton who showed you how to make flat bows. Unfortunately, Chris has just recently passed away, but he was a fantastic bow maker and just a generally fantastic, nice woodworker. Um, we were also lucky enough to do flint napping with John Lord. So that was an amazing experience. And again, such a phenomenal, knowledgeable guy. Um, there was also a lady called Sarah. She was an archeologist, ar archeolo archeologist and she showed us how to make pottery and things like that. There was also Gordon, um, who was the, the forager. Um, again, 
Gordon was a phenomenal uh, encyclopedia of, of knowledge when it comes to uh, plants and everything that you could do with them. Uh, and he's unfortunately just recently passed away as well. So I'm a kind of a Jonah. People I meet seem to uh, to leave this mortal coil. But um, um, it was an amazing experience. It was very different to the woodworking and obviously the tool making that I'd already done sort of by myself. But that really showed me the world of bushcraft as well um, and how it kind of all merges into one another. I never re realised that, that as soon as you start using your hands and you start opening your eyes to the environment and the natural world, everything is connected, even if it's a, a, a small sort of amount. Um, and I almost got addicted to just being in the outdoors, working with my hands and, and all those different materials and elements. And that's part of the reason why I, I love the knife making so much is it it combines metalwork, it combines the knowledge of woodwork for the handles, it combines uh, antler and bone and things like that if you apply those to the handles and obviously it applies to the leatherwork as well to make the sheaths. Um, I don't actually make the sheaths anymore, I've managed to hand that over to somebody that's got a bit more talent than me but uh, that'll, come, that'll come later. Um, so yeah, I'd finished that course and basically at 20 years old um, I had to take these skills that I'd picked up and become self-employed, which was quite kind of daunting. Um, they did send me on a sort of uh, business startup course, which gave me the sort of fundamentals of how to actually sort of go about registering and things like that. But I mean, 20, 20 years old, I had to basically build a workshop, start to set up my, my business and actually start by traveling and doing lots of shows. Normally I'd travel around with my pole lathe and demonstrate turning wood and making rounders bats and things like that. And obviously, sell a few knives on the side really so at that that early stage it was about 50 50 really of woodwork a little bit of teaching and traveling around doing the shows um, and at that stage i went back to clissett wood where i did my apprenticeship and a few people would always want to buy either the crank sets for making their pole aids or spoon carving tools things like that and the one time that i actually went to drop off some tools um, i met uh, a, a very keen woodworker at that stage called Lois who was on one of her courses and I managed to sell her some tools so uh, Lois actually bought some of my first spoon knives because you wanted to get into spoon carving didn't you Lois? So uh, that's when I first met Lois on one of the woodworking courses at Glissett Wood. I'd already left at that stage but Lois bought some tools and then she then wanted to come on one of my training courses and actually learn how to make some protective covers for her own tools. So that's that's where our journey started um, and Lois would come to the workshop and actually learn how to make leather covers. Fortunately, uh, she wanted to learn other skills so she kept coming back and uh, the rest is history really. So after a while, Lois never actually left and I, 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 I could uh, appreciate her skill set as well. So Lois ended up moving into the business as well. Um, but yeah, my, my skill set, I would never have I would have never have believed that it would have opened up these opportunities. Well, for one, I wouldn't have thought that the um, the kid that tried to get out of school as early as possible would ever be stood on a stage talking to people, telling them how, how he got to here. It kind of seems kind of weird that anybody would actually want to know anything about me, really. But uh, it's been quite amazing that the few skills that I've learned has opened opportunities for me to travel to the United States when I was 22, I think we worked it out, wasn't it, Lois? Um, I was asked to go and teach woodworking skills to uh, First Nations people in uh, a, a, a tribe called the Hooper Indians, which live in Hooper, which is just uh, inland from the town of Eureka, which is basically north northwest coast, um, pretty much right on the Oregon border. So going into this um, wild valley with uh, First Nations people where they'd probably not seen many gingers for, for a start and I had to basically help them set up pole aids using, ut utilizing their waste timber that they'd got in their valley, lots of, lots of woodland. The actual area itself was a 20 square mile uh, valley of, of woodland, rivers, just beautiful wilderness really. They got plenty of wood plenty of time, plenty of space, but they needed some skill sets where they could utilize that timber and actually try and make it into furniture and their, for their either their own use or to actually sell as well. So I actually went back to Hooper, 
uh, three years running and spend a month each time setting up workshops and things like that for them um, and got to know the guy that was running it was a guy called George Blake he became a very uh, close friend to me he was another an amazing craftsman a woodworker a potter and a jewelry maker um, and he was the he was the shaker Christian in the in the in the valley so uh, years later when uh, when I Oh, I married Lois. I actually asked George to come over to our, our, our small holding, and George actually married us on on, on the farm. Um, so that was quite an amazing sort of uh, full circle. Uh, the chap that I was teaching how to work would actually sort of help help me uh, fulfil my dream and, and marry Lois really. Um, so yeah, just simple skills of, as I open up this amazing world uh, to me as uh, and be, uh, allow me to travel the world go to different shows, we've travelled to uh, Finland the beginning of the year to a, a knife show, straight after this show I get home, have a few days before I have to pack my bags and I'm going off to the uh, Blade show in Atlanta as well so that's going to be pretty amazing. Um, seeing these knife makers and aspiring to be these knife makers, uh, when I was early days in my knife making career I would be looking at the internet and seeing people like uh, Bob Dozier who trained under Robert Lovelace. Uh, who was one of the pioneers of knife making in the States and he also trained a chap called Tom Crine and the crazy thing is now these people that I saw on the internet thinking wow wouldn't it be amazing to be knife makers like them I I've actually met them, I now know them, they're almost friends and colleagues and uh, I'm going back to Tom's workshop straight after the Blade show and we hang out and we make knives so it's quite amazing that you can have this idea that you'll never know these people and with a little bit of uh, sort of energy and a little bit of dedication to learn some skills, you can actually you can be with these people. You can actually be associated with these people. So it's quite it's quite amazing to me that that my small little uh, path in the craft world, starting from a tiny little converted goat shed on our on our family farm, and now I've got a a, a pretty thriving business thanks to thanks to Lois. We've got a big workshop and and we we love what we do. You know, um, every day is a joy that you can get up and you can walk into the workshop, you can make some fantastic bits of kit that people enjoy using. I mean, Jay's just picked up his latest knife. Um, we've got lots of customers that have had stuff over the years. There's Dan in the front row here. He, he came over and he showed me a knife that he'd bought back in, uh, what do we reckon? It was about 15 years ago, was it? 2004. 2004. So Dan bought one of the very early woodlanders that I made when I was actually help. Uh, helping on a, uh, an axe workshop for a company called Wood Smoke up in the Lake District. Um, and it's quite amazing that these people that I've seen, and, and they've seen the journey with me, you know, they've, they've followed along, they've supported me at that early stage of the game when we, I was first started out in knife making, and they're still using and buying tools from us now. So I can only say thank you for thank you for the support, really. It's, it's really quite humbling, you know. And it's lovely that, I mean, this is why I love coming to do the Bushcraft Show. Yes, we've come in here to sort of show our wares and hopefully give you some sort of skills and show you how to keep all your, your tools nice and sharp. But it's kind of like meeting up with friends and family at the same time. It's a very intimate uh, a, a group of, of, of people that are all interested in the same things, you know. Um, so, yeah, it, I, I can only say thank you, really. Um, the thing that's been quite humbling in the last few months is that, obviously, our business has grown and people like to follow us on social media so people like to see what we're doing on uh, our Instagram feed and our YouTube channel and things like that um, and through through that basically we got asked to be in a in a latest book which I'll show you uh, which has just come out and this is a book called Forge and Carve um, it's got lots of different craftspeople in there it's got bow makers it's got spoon carvers it's got lots of different people, not just in the UK, but all over the world. Um, and they came to our workshop and they thought that it would be a nice um, uh, uh, connection that both me and Lois work in the same uh, workshop, create things that are um, working in harmony with each other, but we're own craftspeople in our own right. Um, initially they came and they were just going to do me and Lois as one, one sort of uh, chapter, but in the end they realised that Lois has got so much to offer that Lois has got her own little section on the uh, leather working in there as well so that, that was quite humbling to actually be asked to be in a, in a book you know um, so that was that was a, a great pleasure and sort of ironically the, 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 the guy that sort of set up this company was a guy that I used to go and build bows and, and work in the woods when I was a, about a 10 year old boy so it's that sort of full circle really which is really really nice um, um, 
a lot of people a lot of people ask us why we chose our logo and I think Jay asked us last night about our, our logo I, initially for me it was because I bought a little pendant off a, another craftsperson when I was first started and it was the symbol of creativity but as you've probably heard with my sort of roundabout storytelling of how I got into it for me it was the fact that I would be traveling along this journey in one direction so say doing the woodworking then I'd find that I'd get to a point where it wouldn't come to a crossroads or a dead end but it would go on a slight deviation because you then needed to learn skills to make your own tools and you'd make your own tools and then suddenly you'd re realize that you'd got to deviate again because you would got to learn how to do leather work to make the sheath so for me it was that whole idea that craft is this lovely symbiotic relationship where it's all connected it's all blended to one but not necessarily on a straight path from A to Z it might be A via whatever <laughs> you know so for me it's that whole connection that everything is is, is one but not necessarily in a, on a straight straight line really um, a lot of other people think that it's because I was a huge Zip Led Zeppelin fan and I was using the same little logo as John Paul Jones so the rock and roll star in me that's the story I tell but really it's the, it's the, the connection of all those crafts really um, so anyway, I hope that you've enjoyed my funny little, funny little waffle of, of how I got into this. Um, the one thing that I would say, um, when I was still at school, there was there was a few of us that were better with our hands than with our than with than with, our, with our heads. And one of the teachers at school almost wrote us off because he said that we would be lucky if we sort of swept the streets when we left school. Now. I'd kind of almost like to go back and tell that teacher that really you can do absolutely anything you want to do as long as you're committed, you know. So, oh, I'm getting a bit emotional. Huh? <laughs> um, but yeah, just follow your heart, you know. Your heart is free. Thanks a lot. the heart everyone thank you so much ben for that for your sharing your truth and your realism with us